Good morning. We're finishing up on Hegel this morning. Um, more specifically, what he has to say about war. Uh, this is on page 299 of the Hegel book here, or the selections of Hegel. Um, <clears throat> it follows a paragraph in which he talks about the nullity of finite things, and that's kind of a description of war uh, so far as Hegel is concerned. Um, so let's take a look at, uh, at what he has to say. The ethical moment in war, right, ethical in that uh, read social, right? <clears throat> the social moment in war is implied in what has been said above, right, about the uh, nullity of finite things. War is not to be regarded as an absolute evil. Remember, there are no absolute negations for Hegel, and that includes something like war. War is not to be regarded as an absolute evil and as a purely external accident. In other words, it's not something that cannot be explained. Which itself, therefore, has some accidental cause. In other words, there can be a trigger to war, which, um, well, the, the, the assassination of that official in Serbia was the trigger for the First World War. Um, an, an accidental cause. Be it injustices, right, there are injustices going on, um, the passions of nations, or the, or the holders of power, right? In other words, uh, remember, passions and emotions are not irrational. Sense can be made of them. Or in short, something uh, or other that should, uh, that should not be or ought not to be. Um, in other words, war is not necessarily something that should not be. Right? It is what is by nature accidental and th that accidents happen. Um, uh, and the, the fate, uh, the, word, the German word there is schicksal, um, and the fate whereby they happen is thus a necessity. There are certain conditions which may render both necessary and understandable the outbreak of a war. Here as elsewhere, the point of view from which things seem to be pure accidents vanish if we look at them in the light of the concept. Okay, remember the, uh, <clears throat> the, the concept is the begriff. Okay, and the begriff is uh, the well concept or notion, uh, and what that, as we saw, what that includes, it includes not only what is right, the notion of what is, but um, what it tends toward. Okay. <clears throat> Okay, um, the brief and philosophy, because philosophy knows accident for, it sh for a show and sees in it its essence, which is necessity. There's a certain, there can, there's a certain necessity to the outbreak of a, of a, of a conflict, and it is uh, necessary, one might say, inevitable. Uh, a good example would be the American Civil War. Right? The American Civil War was, you had the problem of slavery, basically. <clears throat> and the, it was allowed in the Constitution. Right? However, it was an inherently 
the, something that was, was rendered the, the, the republic itself inherently unstable because you had slave states and um, <clears throat> non-slave states and there was slavery even in the non-slave states. Right? So um, it was, in, one might say it was inevitable because of slavery that the um, civil war was going to happen in the United States, which of course it did. Uh, and the trigger for the war was the firing on Mount Sumter. Sumter? Sumter. <clears throat> um, <clears throat> okay, so the civil war, it is, uh, it is necessary that the finite property and life should be definitely established as accidental because accidental, because accidentality is the concept of the finite, right? In other words, things are bound to happen. That's what, that's what he means by fate, right? Um, fate means bound to happen. And the Civil War was bound to happen. It was, <clears throat> one might say, inevitable. Okay, moving down to the uh, next paragraph. War is the state of affairs which deals in earnest with the vanity of temporal goods and concerns. Well, <clears throat> uh, vanitas, vanitatum, <laughs> omnia est, vanitas, right? That comes from, <clears throat> that comes from Koheleth. Uh, the book in the Bi Old Testament book in the Bible, right? Um, uh, Ecclesiastes, Ecclesiastes. <clears throat> um, uh, okay. A vanity at other times a common theme of edifying discourses. Preachers often preached about, well, Koheleth, in Hebrew means preacher. <laughs> so the preacher is always preaching about the vanity of all th and all his vanity, right? Uh, and the chasing after the wind, etc. <clears throat> um, the vanity of all temporal goods. Okay. Vanity at other times a common theme of edifying sermonizing, right? In other words, preachers preach about don't put your trust in finite things. Well, war uh, is going to intensify that uh, particular character. This is what makes it the moment in which the ideality of the particular attains its right and is actualized. <clears throat> okay, war has the higher significance that by its agency, as I have remarked elsewhere, the ethical health of peoples is preserved in their indifference to the stabilization of finite institutions, just as the blowing of the winds preserves the sea from the foulness with which, which would be the result of a prolonged calm. Right. Um, <clears throat> doldrums, right? Societies can, there, a doldrums can, can uh, arise in a society. Uh, one time I was, I talked to, uh, or a Frenchman was talking to me, uh, and we, he was talking, we were talking about war. And he asked me, well, why do, why do wars break out? And I said, well, it's very simple. They break out because people, our neighbors get into arguments over territory, over markets, over economic issues. Um, and he said, no. The cause, no mon père, the cause of war, c'est l'ennui. The cause of war is boredom, right? In other words, life is just too boring and they need a little excitement. <laughs> uh -huh, that was, that's the French view. Um, okay, so where does that leave us? <clears throat> um, doldrums are, the society is, can be in a state of, um, uh, I mean, nothing's happening, and people sense it's nothing's happening, and uh, it's totally boring. Um, result of a prolonged calm, so that so also corruption in nations would be the product of prolonged, let alone um, 
perpetual peace. Um, <clears throat> well, perpetual peace, what he's talking about there is Kant, right? Um, Kant wrote a work on perpetual peace and the way in which to achieve perpetual peace, which was basically uh, establish a league of nations, right? Which, of course, was done in the, right after the uh, First World War, right? The League of Nations to, um, to put an end to war. <clears throat> uh, so, uh, however, <laughs> that's Kant's ideal, right? Um, as far as Hegel is concerned, <clears throat> Perpetual peace for nations, nations getting together as a whole international group. Remember, Hegel begins with the nation state. Right. And that's, that's behind this whole treatment on war. Uh, also, the, uh, the corruption in nations would be the product of prolonged peace. Um, <laughs> there's that famous line in, uh, I think it was uh, Orson Welles uh, utters, regarding the Swiss. In The Third Man, the th it's a film noir from the, right after, right after the Second World War, anyway. And um, Orson Welles plays the part of a rather cynical, uh, well, making money off the war, basically, and, <clears throat> and selling rather bad products at the same time. Anyway, and he, he, the, uh, he asks this rhetorical question. What have the Swiss produced in a thousand years of peace? The cuckoo clock. It's a terrible line. <clears throat> but it's, apparently he had lived it. It wasn't in the actual text or not in the actual score. Okay, the, the, this, however, is said to be only a philosophical idea uh, or use another common expression, justification of providence. Okay, moving down a little further. So <clears throat> what is, okay, what, are, what we're talking about here are the pluses to war, right? In other words, the positive, remember? <clears throat> Whenever there's a negation, there's also positives left over, above all the negation of a negation, right? And so there are always positives left over. Well, what's one positive? Well, this is one positive, right? Vanity. Uh, another um, is, um, uh, it takes care of the doldrums. A society which is too complacent. <clears throat> okay, um, the fact uh, over on page 300, uh, about the fifth line down, this fact appears in history in various forms. Successful wars have checked domestic unrest. Okay, if there is, uh, if there is domestic unrest, what do you do? You get the people together in a, in a united way to face an enemy an attacker, for example. Um, <clears throat> or consolidated the power of the state at home, right? In other words, everyone rallies around the king or rallies around the leader or the czar, whatever. <clears throat> um, rallies around the flag. And they have struggled for their independence with this less glory and success, the less they have been able previously to organize the power of the state in home affairs, right? Now, th things are not going well at home. You can get the people united to do something, right? To defend themselves against the enemy or to uh, uh, attack uh, an enemy. <clears throat> their freedom has died from the fear of dying, uh, okay. Um, moving down to the next paragraph on page 300. Sacrifice on behalf of the individuality of the state is the substantial tie between state and all its members and so is a universal duty. Uh, I recall in the Second World War, 
um, we were urged to collect our old scrap metal um, and rubber to take them to the local recycling place to, so it could be turned into shell casings, tanks, whatever, right? <clears throat> cannons, um, not cannons, artillery pieces. And it, <clears throat> the, uh, so in other words, that was, it was a way of getting the people involved in the, in, in the, in the conflict, right? Um, rubber, of course, because rubber at the time came from Borneo, uh, Sumatra, right? In other words, the southeastern Pacific area, and it was impossible to transport it to make the wheels and tires for trucks, etc., uh, because of German or Japanese U-boats, right? So it meant, what it meant was uh, the uh, uh, we had rubber drives, <clears throat> and what they did with all that stuff, I have no idea. Since this is a tie, uh, is a single aspect of the identity as contrasted with the reality um, of subsistence particulars, it becomes at the same time a particular tie. In other words, it, it involves the populace at an individual level in the war effort. <clears throat> um, uh, all its citizens are in duty, are in duty bound uh, to answer the summons to its defense, right? Uh, there was, I recall this, th this placard of Uncle Sam with the red, white, and blue outfit and pointing and says, Uncle Sam needs you. <laughs> okay, um, moving right along. <clears throat> so it's, it's, uh, uh, it's something that can unite the country. Um, unite around the flag, right? Okay, uh, moving right along. Um, there, it also, one other aspect of, of war is that it brings out the best in people. Like, for example, um, courage, right? Sacrifice. <clears throat> In itself, courage is a formal virtue. Formal. What does he mean by formal? It's not, uh, okay, by this time, wars are not fought with swords and shields and hand to hand combat, right? Um, <clears throat> uh, already at this time, we have cannons. And we have the development of rifles, blunderbusses, uh, no rifles. <clears throat> um, it's a formal version because it is a display of freedom by radical abstraction from all particular ends, possessions, pleasure, and life, right? You have to leave it behind when you go off to war, you have to leave behind what happened back home uh, in order to pursue this task. But this negation is a negation of externalities. Um, and their alienation, the culmination of courage, is not intrinsically of a spiritual uh, character. Right? What does he mean when he says it becomes formal? Well, it's, you're not dealing with hand-to-hand -hand combat. Rather, you may not even see the enemy. Right? I mean, you're shooting the, the, the artillery shell from the cannon, and you don't even necessarily see exactly who, whom it's going to hit. And um, so it's, it's, it becomes more formal, becomes more, yeah. Uh, consider the modern, the modern case where uh, the um, missile is launched from a command center somewhere in Arizona, which is destined to strike some target in Iraq. That becomes very abstract and for, very formal. <clears throat> okay. Um, 
it's an, you're, going to, you're going to need some kind of, um, also involved, involved in the forum, you're going to need some kind of slogan. Um, in the First World War, it was the war to end all wars, right? That was the slogan. <clears throat> Obviously it didn't because then came the Second World War, uh, which was make the world safe for democracy. The Iraq War was, as I recall, Iraqi freedom. You always need a slogan. <clears throat> Um, however phony it may prove to be. Um, <clears throat> uh, okay. The work, uh, about the middle of page 301. Uh, this form of experience thus contains the harshness of extreme conditions, or contradictions. A self-sacrifice which yet is the very existence of one's freedom, the maximum of self-subsistence of individuality, yet only as a cog playing its part in a mechanism, right? In other words, formal. One is merely a cog in the machine. Huh? <clears throat> um, What's the machine? In the war machine. Right. Um, <clears throat> okay, let's, let's move on. Playing its part in the mechanism of an external organization, the army, right, whatever. The Navy, absolute obedience required. Renunciation of personal opinions and reasonings, if you're if your officer tells you to go over the top, you go over the top. <clears throat> um, now, okay, moving right along. Over on page 302, um, he says, hmm. uh, moreover, it seems to be uh, right uh, about the, oh yeah, the fourth or fifth, fifth century from the top, fifth, uh, fifth excuse me, fifth, sentence from the top on page 302. It is for this reason that thought has invented the gun, right? The gun makes courage more formal, right? Um, because you've got a distance between you and the target or the enemy. It is for this reason that thought has invented the gun and the invention of this weapon which has changed the purely personal form of bravery, hand-to-hand -hand combat, into a more abstract one, it is no accident, right? In other words, one, <clears throat> one, as, one important thing about war is that you develop uh, new inventions are developed, <clears throat> right? Which, well, I mean, for example, um, since they couldn't get the rubber from Borneo, and the people were not turning, out, turning in enough old rubber to make enough tires for the trucks and vehicles needed for the war effort. Uh, what did they do? Synthetic rubber, right? Which of course we still, which was a very important invention. Um, and <clears throat> uh, well, think of another one. In order to combat the U-boats, the submarines, that were attacking the shipping lanes between Borneo and the United States, um, the, ah, you developed radar. You could ping off a submarine and then drop, drop depth charges to destroy the submarine, right? And do we still use radar? Oh yes, it's very important. That's how we're able to fly as many planes at the same time up in the air over the United States as we do. Well, of course, at the moment, not too many planes are flying, or fewer planes are fly flying, but we won't go into that. Okay, moving right along. Um, <clears throat> down on page 302, international law. Um, wars uh, affect the whole world. In other words, and uh, that was certainly the case with the World War I and World War II, or even more with World War II. 
Um, international law springs from the relation between autonomous states, right? Remember, he always starts with the notion of the nation state. Um, it is for this reason that what is absolute in it retains the form of an ought to be, since its actuality depends on different wills, each of which is sovereign. Okay. Uh, we, you develop, okay, the international community can develop something like the world court uh, in The Hague. That's an R. Uh, the Hague in the Netherlands, which solves international disputes, right? And above all, uh, those that occur at sea, right? Uh, sea law is always a very special area. Um, <clears throat> or when uh, it, it, to forestall, forestall war, right? Maybe the issue could be settled at the Hague, this argument between two sovereign states. Um, the nation state is mind, right? Spirit, nation state, that's where he starts. In its sub substantive rationality, right? What is actual is rational, etc. And immediate actuality and is therefore the absolute power on earth. Well, it's, it's a little strong, but anyway, it follows that every state is sovereign and autonomous against its neighbors, right? Which, of course, when they get into arguments, that's what why wars necessarily arise. Um, okay, let's move along a little further. Okay, here we go. Over on page 304, uh, paragraph 334, it follows that if states disagree and their particular wills cannot be harmonized, as for example at the World Court in The Hague or through uh, diplomacy or di diplomatic means, the matter can only be settled by war. But remember, war is, Hegel, I think Hegel would say that war is a last resort, right? Um, a, uh, can only be settled by war. Okay, let's, let's move on to uh, 305. Um, <clears throat> paragraph, down at the bottom there, paragraph 338. The fact that states reciprocally recognize each other as states remains even in war, right? In other words, the, um, <clears throat> the, um, even in war, a state remains a state, right? For example, a particular state may declare a state of emergency during a time of war in which uh, various rights are going to be suspended, right? The state of affairs when rights disappear and force and chance hold sway. Um, <clears throat> a bond wherein uh, each counts to the rest as something absolute. Uh, well, there is in war, <clears throat> Mm. There is in war <clears throat> the fog, <laughs> the fog of war, right? In other words, uh, okay, rights are going to be reduced, right? The, you, 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 uh, the rights of assembly, for example, may re be restricted for uh, right of travel, um, uh, And the fog of war is is also um, is also the case with uh, in in battles, right? In a battle, you do not know how things are going to turn out. Uh, each general or general staff uh, plans for a particular uh, battle. However, the act, what actually plays out may not go according to plan. <laughs> Put it that way. <clears throat> um, force and chance hold sway. Um, <clears throat> um, force and chance, wow. Uh, when Spain tried to invade England with the Spanish Armada, what happened to the Spanish Armada? There was this storm. And the storm destroyed the Spanish Armada, so that it did not, could not attack England. <clears throat> um, 
Uh, okay, hence in war, war itself is characterized as something which ought to pass away. You don't want wars lasting. Like in Afghanistan. Or the war in Vietnam, which before Afghanistan was America's longest war. Um, you don't want wars going on forever. Right? You want to have an end to it at some point. <clears throat> Hence in war, war itself is characterized as something which ought to pass away. Um, it implies thereby uh, the proviso of the jus gentium, right? <clears throat> um, that's the, the law of the peoples, the, lo the law of nations, right? Um, <clears throat> or, uh, that the possibility of peace be retained, right? In other words, you've got to figure out um, some way in order to reestablish peace because you can't be at perpetual war perpetually with an enemy because it's going to wreck your economy, if nothing else. <clears throat> Remember the war between Athens and Sparta. It certainly destroyed Athens if it didn't destroy Sparta. It's, it didn't help Sparta either. <clears throat> um, <clears throat> oh yeah, <clears throat> envoys must be respected, right? In other words, if, if you're trying to have a, a truce, um, a lull to the fighting, then what you need to do is to send envoys with white flags right, <clears throat> to get together to discuss terms, right, <clears throat> terms for the truce. Uh, and in general, that war be not waged against domestic institutions, right? <clears throat> um, against the peace of family and private life or against persons in their private capacity. In other words, you don't want, you want, um, you, you wage a war against the enemy, but not against the families of the enemy, or not against the individuals. Uh, that's, it, that's, uh, <clears throat> which of course is a problem with modern wars. <laughs> Um, in other words, wars in the 19th century were relatively gentle, gentlemanly. Uh, you didn't fight beyond sunset. And you had the, you had, they were against, army against army, right? Um, you didn't attack civilians. That was, that was a no-no. And um, however, in modern warfare, you have guerrilla wars, ooh, ugly. You have terrorism. Mm where the innocent are actually targeted. And then, of course, in the Second World War, we have what was called total war, and bombing of cities in England, bombing of cities in Germany. Well, and then the use of the atom bomb in Hiroshima and Nagasaki, um, <clears throat> where a lot of in, where ordinary civilians were killed, and of course in terrorism, where they're deliberately targeted. Uh, Hegel would not approve of that. Apart from this, uh, relations between states in wartime, reciprocal agreements about taking prisoners in peacetime, concessions of rights to subjects of other states for the purpose of private trade and intercourse. In other words, you have the, um, you have the uh, Geneva, Convention, okay, <clears throat> which govern um, the way in which nations um, uh, deal with prisoners, right? Um, you can't show them. <clears throat> uh, peace on concessions of rights to subjects of other states, uh, they must be treated properly. For the purpose of private trade and intercourse, this business still has to go on. <clears throat> Depend principally on the customs of nations, custom being the inner universality of behavior maintained in all circumstances. Well, I mean, for example, <clears throat> um, uh, we don't use the word torture anymore. You can't torture prisoners. Right? Um, 
I, I, I think that we use the euphemism enhanced interrogation techniques. Um, but according to the Geneva, Geneva Convention, it is, um, tor the use of torture is a no-no. Right. And nations have gotten together um, to outlaw it so that presumably it happens, it doesn't happen. <clears throat> it is as particular entities that states enter into relations with one another. Hence, their relations are on the largest scale a maelstrom of external contingency, the inner particularity of passions, private interests, selfish, it's, it's a complicated world. <laughs> um, vices, forces, and wrong. As these whirl together, a maelstrom, and in their vortex, a maelstrom, the ethical whole itself, the autonomy of the state, is exposed to contingency, right? In other words, uh, in, the state, in a state of war, um, not only the losers suffer, but the winners do as well. Um, England won, was on the winning side in the Second World War, but it lost an empire. And um, it's, uh, the principles of the national minds are wholly restricted on account of their particularity, for it is in this particularity that as extant individuals, they have their objective actuality and their self-consciousness. Their deeds and destinies in their reciprocal relations to one another are the dialectic, right, the dialectic, of the finitude of these minds, right? In other words, it's a, it's, it's a, <clears throat> one might, a dialectic, it's, it's related to the, the, the word dialogue. And when nature, nations are at peace, they are in dialogue, in trade and commerce, but even in war, they are in dialogue. They're speaking to each other. They're sending salvos back and forth <laughs> between each other. Um, <clears throat> free from all restrictions producing itself as a woman. And its uh, right is the highest right, okay. Over these finite minds in the history of the world, which is the world's court of judgment. Uh, uh, <clears throat> he's um, uh, <clears throat> taking a, a quote from Schiller, uh, a German poet. Right. And um, Schiller says famously, Weltgeschichte ist Weltgericht. Uh, world history is world judgment. Right? Or, uh, history, the history of the world, which is the world's court of judgment. Um, uh, history makes judgment on peoples and what they do and what they don't do relative to wars. Okay, um, uh, <clears throat> for, uh, we have to do the credits. Uh, the credit go to our, product, our producer and director, Brother Damien, and you, you can always send him an email to thank him for his inestimable services. <laughs>